I'm Shepard Smith. This is Studio B. It's the bottom of the hour. Time for the top of the news. The White House is set to make a major announcement just minutes from now. The Attorney General Eric Holder will lay out a legal framework to justify the targeted killing of U.S. citizens overseas. This comes more than five months after U.S.-led drone strike took out the American-born cleric Anwar al-Walaki in Yemen. Al-Walaki was the first American on the CIA's capture or kill list. The feds linked him to the Fort Hood massacre, the attempted Christmas Day underwear bombing, and the botched Times Square bombing. Civil libertarian groups have raised major red flags, ar arguing that the decision to kill an American citizen without even due process violates the U.S. Constitution. Catherine Herridge is live in Washington. Catherine, do we have any idea what the Attorney General is expected to say today? Well, we do, Shep. We expect that the Attorney General, Eric Holder, will argue that the killing of an American terrorist or alleged terrorist abroad is legal under the 2001 Congressional Authorization of the Use of Military Force. We do not expect Holder to reveal the intelligence that led to the targeting of the American cleric Anwar al-Awlaki. And at least one Republican presidential candidate says the administration's actions are inconsistent with the Constitution. Just to say that under certain circumstances that the president can make this decision on who should be assassinated, I don't see how he can ever get around to justifying that. And no matter how, how noble it may sound and no matter how he might make it sense for national defense purposes, if the American people accept that, I think it would be a serious mistake. And for some context, in the span of one month last fall, three American citizens were dead at the hands of the U.S. government, including Alaki's American-born son and North Carolina native Samir Khan. Both kills were described by U.S. officials as collateral damage. That said, Fox News has learned that serious thought was being given at the time to adding Khan to the CIA kill list. That would have made him the second American targeted for death show. Civil liberties groups are speaking out, right, Catherine? Well, to say the least, we contacted the ACLU and Human Rights Watch. Both have been critics of the administration's kill policy, and both groups said that they would not comment on camera or provide written statements until after Holder's speech. Senior Democrats, including Carl Levin, chair of the Senate Armed Services Committee, and Dianne Feinstein, chair of the Senate Intelligence Committee, both have urged the administration to release the memo that justified the killing of a U.S. citizen. Now, there is a glaring inconsistency here. The White House wanted to bring the 9-11 suspects to a federal court in New York City, as you remember, where they would have the presumption of innocence and full constitutional rights. Yet the administration was judge, jury, and executioner for an American without due process in court. So we'll see how that plays out at the speech uh, about an hour from now, Shepard. We'll be watching for it. Catherine Harris in Washington. Catherine, thank you. You're welcome. All right, let's take this to the judge. Fox News senior judicial analyst, Judge Andrew Napolitano, was with us. Uh, Catherine says it's uh, two different cases, two different, two different plans, not much of an understanding of why it is that this one is this way and the other one's the other well, way. Well, in, in my view, Catherine is correct, and Catherine and I have seen the speech. We're not permitted to quote from it yet because he's going to give it about an hour from now at Northwestern University Law School outside of Chicago. But basically, the attorney general in that speech will argue that the administration substituted its own form of due process, assuring itself that this guy was a bad guy and convincing itself that this guy was about to do more harm and thus made itself judge, jury, and executioner. Now, no president since Abraham Lincoln has claimed the power to kill another American, and even Lincoln said he was doing it in a wartime environment when people were shooting at each other and, and the shooting back was in self-defense. But President Obama is taking the position, as Catherine just said, that he can be judge, jury, and executioner without a jury, without a charge, without a grand jury, without a lawyer, without any of the basic requirements of due process. Due process is not something the government gives. Due process is, is a natural right that every human being has, and the Constitution requires the government to respect that in the Fifth Amendment. Every human being, foreign born, American born, American citizen, otherwise, whether you're hanging out in France or in Afghanistan or in Chicago. It's interesting you should say that, Shep, because the wording of the Fifth Amendment says that due process belongs to every person. The Attorney General in his speech is the only quote I'm going to give you, says it applies only to American citizens. That's not true. No, it's not true, but it is irrelevant here because the three people who died, Anwar al-Awlaki, his 16-year-old son and their friend, were all Americans. Okay. Uh, if you know, if you have videotape of some dude blowing up a building in Sheboygan uh, and he's running away, can now the government just go murder him? Well, 
on the basis of the theory set forth in this speech, and, and it is a speech, it's not a legal document, it doesn't quote and cite cases and, and, uh, and opinions and statutes, it's a summary of what the Attorney General believes is the law. But on the basis of that summary, the President can be judge, jury, and executioner for any American anywhere if the President has decided the evidence of guilt is overwhelming and the likelihood of committing more harm is also overwhelming. That's not what the Constitution says. There is no law that says that, but that's the position that this president and his attorney general are taking. I wonder if people who think it's a very good idea that we took out Anwar al awlaki it sounds like he's a pretty bad guy. I mean, there was the Fort Hood tie, there was the underwear bombing that didn't work, and the Times Square bombing that didn't work. Well, not a good guy, wanted people dead, probably better that he's not here. But if they feel that way about other people, like maybe your brother or something does something bad, and they say, okay, we're just gonna shoot you, we could really eliminate we could really eliminate the court system and just and just let the government decide who to murder and uh, who to let go. You, you could make that argument on the basis of what the Attorney General is about to say at Northwestern Law School. You could also make Catherine's argument. Why not send some drones to Guantanamo Bay? Why even bother trying those people? Sure. She makes the argument. Why bother? She Why makes not just the set argument it on fire and let them die in a fiery blaze? Correct. Correct. Style Correct. We make these arguments facetiously, maybe, or, but they follow from I, what the AG will it, say. It seems to work perfectly under the logic. I mean, Tim McVeigh blew up the Oklahoma City Federal Building. They had to track him down, give him a trial before they killed him. Now we don't have to worry about the trial, save a lot of money, just go and have the government murder everybody. Well, that, that would destroy the basic rights under the Constitution, which oh, but, some but, have argued this president is doing. Has, has this already destroyed the basic rights under the Constitution? Yes, it has. Yes, it has. If, if what the Attorney General is about to say in an hour or so outside of Chicago is accepted uncritically by Americans, then we are we're doomed. Our freedoms are gone. And the president is no longer a president. He's a king. He can decide who lives and who dies on his own without any evidence, without any trial. Of course, what's going to happen is this is going to go through and that's going to be it and nothing happened, right? I, d I don't know what will happen. Maybe Mr. Uh, Alaki's heirs can sue the government for, oh, uh, for murdering him. Where, where is a case like that going to go? Nowhere. And I wouldn't get the money to do that. That's silly. All right, we'll see what happens. Call me okay, in 10 sure. years. Call me in 10 years. Let's see how we're doing. Okay. I'll call you after he gives the speech. All right. <laughs> Thank you. You're welcome. Maybe we should just send, I mean, it's time to send drones to Syria, too. Is as far as John McCain's concerned, and then we've got to go take out Iran's nuclear stuff, which we may be able to do, may not be able to do. Just start five or six more wars and just kill everybody. And what will we do when the people who replace the people we killed are worse than the people we killed? Hmm. Sounds like Afghanistan from a few decades ago, doesn't it? There you go. Hmm. Nine attorneys general are banding together to fight what they say are violations of states' rights by this Obama administration. But will they be successful? We are joined right now by Fox News senior judi judicial analyst and the author of the Constitution in Exile, so we'd know about this kind of stuff, Judge Andrew <laughs> Altano. Good morning to you. Look at that youngster on the front yeah. cover. Of the Good morning book. To you. I was in high school, I think. <laughs> <laughs> Good morning, guys. In, in the history of the United States, when was the last time? There's your uh, book right there. When, uh, when was the last time a bunch of attorneys generals banded together to speak out against the president in this fashion? I, I don't know of one, at least not in modern times. Uh, we have seen, for the past 100 years, since the presidencies of Theodore Roosevelt and Woodrow Wilson, a continuing growth of the federal government and a continuing shrinkage of the power of the states in things like everyday government, from speed limits on highways to the regulation of alcohol right. to the regulation of schools. Congress has gone away with, uh, gotten away with this by dangling money in front of the states. Sure. Take this money but do this, even though the this we don't have the power to regulate. So Example. We do it. Right. You, you, the, the government offered, the federal government offered in the Reagan administration to pave the highways in the states as long as the states lowered their speed limits to 55 miles an hour. Every state but Boom. South Dakota said right. yes. South Dakota sued and said we want the money, but we don't want the strings. The Supreme Court said you take the money, you take the strings. Bad, so man. that's how Congress gets away with regulating things in the states, taking power from the states right. by giving them the cash. But this administration in three and a half years has got quite a list, and this is why yes. the attorney generals have bound it together. Here's an example. Number one, Obamacare. They think that is someplace, the, the mandate within Obamacare, that's something that's got to be addressed. Here's their legitimate, in my view, beef about Obamacare. It forces the states to raise money and uh, by taxes and tells the states how to spend it. This is one of the challenges of Obamacare that will be argued before the Supreme Court later on this month. Can right. the Congress tell the states what to do with their own tax dollars? Plus, we just had on the screen for a moment uh, the 
a contraceptive mandate, which has got the new Cardinal of New York absolutely furious at this administration. Well, this, this is a profound violation of, of First Amendment rights, and it's an area of human behavior where the government should have no say whatsoever. Is it, a, is it really a war on women? That's what the left says. Well, that's what the, that's, what the, that's what the left says, because the left wants the government to provide free health care for everybody, and the left doesn't care about the religious liberties of those of us who don't think the government should be providing in, us. In Oklahoma, uh, you're looking at the EPA illegally taking over Oklahoma's authority in the Clean Air Act. EPA is everywhere over the last three and a half years. The EPA is everywhere. The EPA is a particularly horrendous example, Brian, because the Congress defeated some regulations that the EPA enacted. So you have the people's elected representatives saying no, and you have a bunch of bureaucrats appointed by the president saying yes, and they have the force of law behind them. That is not the way the Constitution is supposed to work. You know, he knows so much about the Constitution. It's a good thing he's written some books. Right. <laughs> he could hear you. <laughs> Mr. Borgnine, speaking into my uh, lapel. <laughs> Let's not talk about Borgnine. I know. Yeah. Oh, Airwolf. Yeah. There you go. Uh, Thank you, pleasure. Josh. Guys, thank you. <laughs> Well, she hit the jackpot. Now taxpayers are feeling jacked up, not because Amanda Clayton won $1 million, good for her, but because she's still using food stamps. Bad for us. Is that even legal? All right. Judge Edith Napolitano is in the house. Judge, what do you think of this? Well, it is not legal. Now, she is receiving a Michigan version, state of Michigan version of, of food stamps called the Michigan Bridge Card, basically a debit card into which $200 is automatically wired every month. Because at the time she applied for this debit card, a form of assistance by the, by the state, she qualified for it. But she has an obligation when she signed up for this. She signed a piece of paper saying, if I have an increase in income or experience some sort of wealth, I'll tell you. She is mysteriously taking the position that she's entitled to this million dollars. She took 500000 in cash, post taxes, lump sum up front. She's taking the position that she doesn't have to tell them, they already know, and that she's entitled to the $200 a week as well as the 500000 that she's already received. Um, whatever Michigan's laws are, I don't know. On, on a legal on the legal side of this, uh, can she claim one time, one cash shot event? This isn't salary. This isn't something I'm getting regularly. Uh, so that's why I'm doing it. No, she cannot. Well, yes, she can claim that, but she will probably lose if she makes that claim. She is taking the mysterious position that she doesn't have to tell the state anything. But, Neil, think about it. The same state government that paid her the 500000 is paying her the $200 a week. So they can administratively adjust this on their own. She runs... Can they, though? That would be well, of two course different they... appendages. No, of, of course they could, because they have actual knowledge of the fact that she no longer qualifies for the $200 a week. But she's got week. the half million already, right? She has the half That's million. In the bank, so she has back. the half million in the bank. And if so she they can't come back and take that back? No, no, no. They could just stop the 200000 because information has come to us uh, by, from which we have concluded that you no longer qualify for the $200 a week, so we're going to terminate it. But isn't that required of everyone if you get a, 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 you know, SSI or something like that? You have to eventually or keep informing the government yes. as to whether you still deserve it. But many of those recipients do not. Correct. If you're on unemployment and you get another job and that job is, let's say, under the table, off the books, you are supposed to tell unemployment. But if it's on the books, well, that's, the, that, that they can cross. Then the employer will inform unemployment because the employer will start making contributions to the state for you. Look, this is, a, this is an example of modern-day high-tech fraud. In her case, it's fraud by silence, by refusing to say what she is obliged to tell the state. Unfortunately, if the state is watching now, they know that she has the 500000 in the bank and is still collecting the 200 bucks a week. Now, when you were a judge, you would, you would throw someone like that in jail for the rest of their lives, period. <laughs> you have this image of me of being some sort of a monster. Yes. <laughs> I did. I would say someone double, someone double parked there on death row. All right. All right. Judge, thank you very, very much. My pleasure. Oh, well, Martha. Great. Well, Wisconsin's attorney general will now appeal a ruling to block the state's new voter ID law. The AG is defending that law for its aim to stop illegal voting. Wisconsin's one of 31 states that requires people to show ID when they come to the polls to vote. Judge Andrew Napolitano, Fox News senior judicial analyst, here to weigh in on that uh, from our newsroom. Good morning, Judge. Good morning, Martha. I wish I could kick a 51-yard field goal. Me too. <laughs> Isn't that cool? It's 
Great. Wow. So what do you think of this? I mean, basically, you know, they passed this law, uh, and then they said they couldn't put it into effect, right? You, you know, the, the interaction of uh, the government and individuals with respect to voting is one of the few areas that the Constitution and the federal government have left to the states. So it's different in each uh, state. And the many states that do require voter IDs look on voting as a privilege. And because it's a privilege, like driving a car, you have the, the government has the right to f compel you to identify yourself. Wisconsin doesn't look upon voting as a privilege. It looks upon it as a fundamental right, sort of like speech or religion or thought. And so Wisconsin takes the position that you don't have to prove that you are entitled to vote if the government has to prove that you're not entitled to vote. Now, that, that is a distinction with a difference. It basically says that in a state like Wisconsin, where the right to vote is fundamental, you can't make somebody show an ID in order to vote any more than you can make them show you an ID before they can speak in public or walk down the street. Interesting. So it's a state issue, uh, yes. and we've seen a lot of states that are getting heat. Uh, we just showed them on the map, 31 of them, many of which are getting heat for this law. You know, there, a lot of folks look at this and say there's politics involved, that, that the only reason that these laws are passed is because they want to find a way to exclude certain people from voting, minorities primarily. Yes. What yes. say you? Yes, yes, that, that, that is an argument that is being made by certain groups who typically don't have uh, government-issued IDs. The uh, court in Wisconsin found there was no evidence for that. Now, there has not yet been a trial in Wisconsin, Martha. That's what's very interesting about this. This is a preliminary injunction. This is a ruling by a judge on the basis of papers that were submitted to him before any trial takes place. So there still needs to be a trial here. And if the state of Wisconsin can demonstrate there is a problem with people voting who don't have the right to vote because they voted elsewhere or because they don't live where they claim they have the right to vote, then this law could be resurrected because requiring a voter ID, the federal courts have found, is a reasonable and inoffensive way of making sure that the right people vote. Do you agree with that? With what? Do you think that, I mean, do you have any problem with it? Do you have any problem, you know, because you've written so many I, books on the Constitution and on freedom in this country, so I'm curious what your, what your opinion is. I do not can. think that showing an ID before you get into a voting booth interferes with your right to vote or unduly burdensome, burdens it. In fact, I think showing an ID before you vote assures that you are who you claim to be, that you right. live where you want to vote, where you intend yeah. to vote, and that you have the right to vote there. Right. But I'm not the judge in Wisconsin, and he apparently disagrees with me. All right. Uh, I always find it amazing that you just have to walk in and identify your signature from last time uh, in a book. It seems too easy in some ways, but uh, right. we'll see. It's being hashed out in the courts. Judge, thank you so much. Pleasure, Mark. But he is the judge around The U.S. Here. government now laying out its legal argument for killing American citizens overseas without a trial. But what about targeting people on U.S. soil? Can they now kill American citizens inside the country? <laughs> the head of the FBI, when asked about that on Capitol Hill yesterday, stumbled around on this. Does that only apply to U.S. citizen that's overseas, or does that apply to U.S. citizen that's here? As well? I'd have to go back. I, I, uh, I, I'm not certain whether that was addressed or not. So that you, we have clarity here, he is not certain whether it was addressed whether our government can kill our own people inside our own country. This really needs to be addressed? We can't just answer this question? No, the government doesn't kill our own people. We have a process for this. It's called the justice system. You file charges, you lock them up, you try them before a jury of their peers, and then that's how... They don't kill our own people! Judge! You, the question is, can they kill our own citizens inside our own country? Well, the answer, this is a question we have to ask? It's, it's not a question that we should have to ask, and it's not a question that she, he should have evaded answering. I think he probably knows that the answer is no, but he doesn't want to frustrate his bosses who articulated just two days earlier that the answer is yes. Because at a speech on Tuesday at Northwestern University Law School, the Attorney General of the United States manifested extraordinary ignorance of the Constitution of the United States and suggested suggest that the president can kill anybody he wants outside the United States if that person is dangerous, if that person has committed crimes, and if it's impractical to arrest that person. Not in the opinion of a jury, but in the opinion of the president and some secret advisors. The Constitution says to the contrary. The Constitution says if the government wants your life or your liberty or your property, 
It has to articulate to a jury what law you have violated and prove its case beyond a reasonable doubt to that jury. It's called due process. Without due process, the government could take anything it wanted and kill anybody it wanted. And Attorney General Holder ought to know that. I suggest that Bob Mueller does. And the reason he evaded that answer is because he wants to keep his job. Well, you heard what Eric Holder said. He said there is due process, but there is not due jurist something or other. Judicial process. Not judicial process. What the Attorney what? General said, let me make his argument. His yeah, argument, his argument is that there is a substituted form of due process. That if the president and his advisors carefully consider the danger of a human being and conclude that that human being needs to be stopped before that person causes any more danger, then the president can kill him. That's their argument. There is no case law that stands for that. There is no statute that authorizes it. And it directly defies the Fifth Amendment to the Constitution. Sounds like a crime against humanity. What's the difference between that and what Bashar al-Assad is doing to his own people? What is the difference? Nothing. What's the difference between killing somebody, an American with a drone in, in Yemen and killing an American with a drone in Peoria? Nothing. Right. Same argument that Eric Holder made at the uh, Northwestern Law School on Tuesday uh, about uh, Awalaki in Yemen could be made about somebody in Peoria tomorrow. You make an illegal lane change in Hollywood on the 101 freeway and a drone will just shoot you out of the sky and throw you, you know, bury you. Well, I don't know that it's going to I don't, I don't know either, either but who would have thought we'd ever that. get to here? Who, who would have thought that we'd even be having a conversation like this? That the attorney, that the head of the FBI would hesitate to answer a question that is so imbued in our history and our law and our values, due process precedes punishment, that he can't answer that in public. And we're worried about contraception. Uh, correct. Correct. We do not have our priorities straight. The last time the federal government claimed that it could kill Americans was in the Civil War. And even Lincoln said it could only be done in, during combat. This federal government, this administration, says it can kill Americans when they're riding with their children in a car in a desert. I don't know, Judge. Thank you. You're welcome. Keep watching them, please. Of course. Thanks for having me. Federal Eric Holder on Tuesday attempting to justify the presidential killing of Anwar al-Awlaki. Remember, he was the American terrorist killed with a drone. But did the government have the right to order the killing? of an American without due process. This is going to be an interesting discussion. And the, is the administration attacking our Constitution? Let's bring in Fox News senior judicial analyst. Judge, what do you Good think? Good morning, I guys. Mean, morning. We're all friends, even if we disagree. Because <laughs> on first bluff, you say, if they want to kill us, even if they're Americans, we should be able to kill them, no? No. The Constitution, the people who wrote the Constitution, did not trust the power to kill in the hands of anybody, even the president. Now, we're not talking about wartime. The last time the federal government claimed the power to kill Americans was during the Civil War. And even Lincoln said, only when someone's shooting at you. Right. Here, the federal government is saying, we have the right to kill an American without any due process whatsoever. What is due process? It is the notification that you have violated the law and the government's obligation to prove to a neutral jury in public that you violated the law and you having all the constitutional protections to defend yourself. Without that due process, the government could take anybody's property and the government could take anybody's life life and the founders who had lived under the british king wrote the constitution to prevent that from happening mm -hmm. so what due process did anwar alaki get let's concede that he was a terrorist let's agree that he was a madman a monster who provoked horrific events here in the united states that resulted in the in the deaths of innocents he was an american yes he was, born, he was, big born, he was born in new mexico he was never charged with a crime he was never indicted for a crime, and the so-called due process he got was a secret meeting in the White House with President Ob Obama and his advisors. Would you trust that gaggle with your life, Eric? Of course but, but, not. But, okay, so the difference here is that you would be in favor of the way in which Osama bin Laden was killed. Because he I didn't get due process either, but the difference is he was not an American citizen. No. W without getting too technical. The clause in the Constitution that requires due process requires it of all persons. Osama bin Laden is a different situation Why? than Anwar al-Awlaki. Well, because Osama bin Laden acknowledged that he was involved right. in the most horrendous event uh, of modern so, times. So did, so did al to No, no, no. al doesn't acknowledge that he was involved in any act of, uh, of violence. Osama bin Laden had been indicted and had been charged. Ostensibly, they were there to seize him, to arrest him. I'm not defending what the SEALs did, and I'm not attacking what the SEALs right. did. Like everybody, I'm glad bin Laden is gone. But this case involving this American could set a dangerous precedent, and here's why. Bob Mueller, the director of the FBI, a fine public servant who truly understands the Constitution, when asked under oath on Tuesday by a congressman, can the president kill an American in America, 
said, I can't answer that. Right. You'll have to ask Attorney General Holder. It is reprehensible that he couldn't answer. He knows sure. the answer is no, but he wants to keep his right. job, so he's not going to defy his well, boss, Eric Holder. That's right. an interesting what? way to put it. Well, what about going. under the cover? You said during wartime things are, are different. Now, during the Bush administration, we had this war on terror, but this administration prefers not to use that term. We're not at war with terror Look, if, currently. If, but, you know, given what you had said earlier, it would seem like that would be an easy out for them. If the CIA went to arrest Alaki and he pulled out a gun, of course they could shoot him. Of course they could use force in that environment. But he was, he was riding in a car in a desert with a 16-year-old son who also was killed, who also was murdered by the federal government. The Constitution was written precisely to prevent that from happening. And the danger is, if they can do it in Yemen, can they do it in Peoria? Well, then why doesn't that kid's family or his heirs uh, bring suit against the federal government? I really don't know. Their grandfather, Alaki's father, brought a suit against the federal government before Alaki was killed to get a federal judge to prevent they the are. president they from are. killing no, no. him. And the judge said... You, you filed too soon. you got to wait till something the, happens. The, the right. ACLU is filing a suit, it's my understanding, against... So, it's so, very interesting to see what kind of evidence comes out in the lawsuit. Judge, we got to go, but very quickly, what, what strikes me is what the big concern would be, uh, you know, radical Islamists uh, apply for citizenship, and then they're covered by the Constitution. Good point. Uh, it's, it's the price we pay for, uh, for freedom. Fair enough. All, All right. right. Pleasure. Hot topics, right. my friend. Yes, it is. Hot lady Thanks in for red. <laughs> okay. Up. Well, right now, the debate is raging over the NYPD's surveillance of Muslims throughout the New York City area and beyond. And the beyond part is key here. Critics insist the practice is racial profiling run amok and condones spying on private citizens. Defenders claim this is just old-fashioned detective work, investigative work, and the goal is to protect what is arguably the terrorist number one target in the Western world, the Big Apple. Now, just yesterday, Attorney General Eric Holder said what he's read about the program is, quote, disturbing. The Justice Department now is reportedly reviewing whether to launch an official investigation. Judge Andrew Napolitano is Fox Senior Judicial Analyst. And so, Judge, let's start with that investigation. What exactly would that investigation look like if it went forward? It would probably look like FBI agents investigating exactly what the New York City police were doing. If, for example, the New York City police were gathering publicly available information in order to uh, permit them to fight crime, to keep the city free and, and safe, to, to decide how to allocate uh, uh, priorities and, and resources, that's perfectly acceptable. And, and it doesn't require a search warrant, and it's not unlawful, and it's a good and healthy thing for the police to do. If, on the other hand, the New York City police were inside New Jersey and were monitoring phone conversations or even in-person conversations or use of computers without a search warrant, that would violate federal and New Jersey law, and then the FBI and the Justice Department would have to decide what they wanted to do about it. Now, so the initial inquiry is, sure. what were the police doing in New Jersey? Was it benign? or was it against the Constitution? Now, Judge, you wrote about a, a scenario that happened in New Jersey, and it was, I'll let you go ahead and explain it, but it wasn't just the NYPD by themselves. They were also with a CIA agent, another federal agency, and the FBI kind of stumbled in on them. So explain to us that dynamic, because it wasn't simply the NYPD against right. the FBI. There was another federal agency involved. This is a very disturbing, and from the point of view of people who watch this for a living, a, a fascinating scenario. In June of 2009, a janitor in an office building in New Brunswick, New Jersey, was assigned to clean an office, and he noticed in there what he assumed was terrorist literature and surveillance equipment high-tech equipment. He called his boss, who called the local police, who dispatched, or called the FBI, and the FBI and the local police raided this uh, office. When they raided it, they found five people there using high-tech surveillance equipment, monitoring people's conversations. Four of the five were New York City police officers, and one of them was a CIA agent. Now, this immediately creates a lot of problems. Who should arrest whom? Should the FBI arrest the New York City cops for using surveillance equipment without a search warrant? Should they arrest the CIA agent for using surveillance equipment in the United States? Because federal law limits the CIA's surveillance behavior to outside the United States. 
Or should the NYPD arrest the FBI for breaking into a legitimate law enforcement function in New Brunswick, it New Jersey? It sounds like a bad riddle. Okay, but let's just take a big step back, Judge. At the same time, you got a janitor that had his eyes and ears open, saw yes. something that he didn't like, yes. and alerted authorities. And you know what? All the authorities happen to be involved, but isn't that actually a good thing in, in the fact that people are aware and, well, there's something else going on or something weird going on? you got a lot of people involved and maybe stepping on each other's toes, but we haven't seen another terrorist. Attack. As a result of what the janitor did, we, we discovered the tip of this iceberg and we seem to be discovering more and more with every uh, tick of the clock. If the New York City police were in New Brunswick, New Jersey, with the knowledge and consent of federal, state and local authorities and they were acquiring publicly available information, there's no issue there. But if they were using monitoring equipment to surveil conversations or computer use without a search warrant issued by a judge in New Jersey, then they were violating federal hmm. and state law. And it's good that the janitor caused this to be exposed. Interesting. Just a quick final question, because this debate continues about what the NYPD is doing, whether or not they're doing the right thing, and right. a lot of different emotions involved in this. But considering the threats against this country right now, do you think our laws have kept up with those threats? Do you think the laws are helping us prevent further attacks, or do you see that maybe the laws haven't grown with some of these threats? I, I think that the laws are more than adequate to keep us both free and safe, and it is the job of the police and the FBI and the government to keep us free and safe. If they keep us safe but not free, they're mm. not doing their job. In terms of Ray Kelly, his heart is in the right place. He's the best police commissioner in the country today. He understands and appreciates the Constitution uh, better, in my view, than any major law enforcement uh, figure of whom I am aware. But even he has to obey the law like the rest of us. Interesting way you put it, safe but not free, but still there's so many questions involving this. Judge, I'm sure we'll have you back on this, by the way. Pleasure, Ms. Jenna. Thank you very much. You're welcome.